You're watching Twin Tears Sunday with Leanne DeRosa. Welcome to Twin Tears Sunday. I'm your host, Leanne DeRosa. Today we're taking a tour through the beautiful Finger Lakes wine country, spanning across Cuca, Seneca, and Cayuga Lakes with more than 100 wineries scattered throughout. Did you know that New York State is the country's third largest grape and wine producer? And today we're going to talk about how those products go from vine to bottle, but first let's start with how this region that you know today all started in the first place. The Finger Lakes wine region dates all the way back to the 1930s. The reason for the 30s, 40s, and 50s was uh, we were, I mean I wasn't, but uh, people who were in this area uh, were, were growing grapes and, and marketing them to some of the larger wineries. But those big wineries are not exactly like the hundreds of small, family-owned wineries you know today. Most are farm wineries. They produce less than 150,000 gallons of wine using exclusively New York State fruits. But at that time, they faced a lot of challenges. Take Lenora, for example. What we could do is we were growing grapes and we were selling them to the larger wineries that were in existence in those days. Uh, examples would be the Taylor Wine Company, Gold Seal, Pleasant Valley, Widmer's, and, and so forth. Uh, and we could, uh, as growers, establish a winery uh, but, however, we would have to have a commercial winery license and the challenge with that was that we could only sell 5% of our production at retail and the, the consequence of that is, is uh, there's not really enough money by selling only 5% at retail to justify the expense of, of establishing a winery. Until the New York Farm Winery Act was passed in 1976. This act made licensing fees cheaper, but most importantly, it allowed small wineries to sell their products directly to the consumer. The, the major part of that legislation was the fact that it allowed a small winery under 50,000 gallons in those days to sell everything it produced at retail. And uh, that made a significant difference in the profitability of a winery. As an example, if a bottle of wine were to sell for $10 at retail, through the three-tier distribution system, it would leave the winery at $5. So in essence, what the Farm Winery Act did was allow the smaller producers to put all of that $10 in their pocket. That's when Glenora opened its doors as a full-fledged winery. We were the first on, on Seneca Lake, uh, started building the, actually the building that we're in right now in the spring of 1977. Uh, produced wine in the fall of 77 and formally opened our doors uh, to consumers and selling wine in uh, May of 1978. So what was it like on the lake back then? A little bit lonely. Uh, obviously today with, uh, as, as we drive around just Seneca Lake as an example, there's over 60 wineries, there's distilleries, there's breweries, there's restaurants, uh, lodging facilities. Uh, none of those were there in uh, 1977. With respect to the grapes, we were selling them to the, the larger wineries. In terms of, of the wines, they were pretty much sold locally, people coming to visit us uh, at, the, at the winery. And then also, it was, we were a little bit unique when we approached some of the wine shops in the area because they didn't have Finger Lakes wines. And miles away on Cayuga Lake, it was the same for the Lucas family, selling their grapes locally. So we felt, you know, it's in the grapes, we're growing these beautiful grapes and everybody else is getting recognition. So we kind of, we wanted to do it. Until they splurged for their own license in 1980. We were first on Cayuga Lake and we, our tasting room was the kitchen in our house. And if someone would pull in, the kids would go out, show them the tank, bring them in to taste wine. The Finger Lakes wine region was a hidden gem. Not many people knew about it, and there weren't many wineries. There wasn't a people that stopped by. They saw a sign on Route 96 or Route 89, and they were curious. Uh, they were here to see the lakes, the gorges, the beautiful scenery, and they were really like, oh, there's wineries here. And um, so it was the beginning of a good time. Lucas Vineyards up on the hills of Cayuga Lake struggled to get visitors throughout the 80s. They needed a way to put their name out there. 
That's how the Cayuga Lake Wine Trail was born. There were four other wineries that were having the same problem we were having, getting visitors to come to our door. And we kind of said, well, if we, can't, we came out with a brochure and worked together, people would come and visit five wineries on Cayuga Lake. So that's how it all started. Soon the idea of a wine trail spread to Seneca and Cayuga Lake as well. Within years, more and more businesses started popping up along the lakes too. For the first two or three years, it was relatively slow. By 1985, there were probably uh, 15 to 16 wineries in the Finger Lakes region. That's not Seneca Lake, that's uh, the Finger Lakes region. And the region we know today started to blossom. Uh, however, it was really the late 90s and through the uh, period of 2000 when we, we saw the, uh, the expansion of, of the wineries. And a lot of that uh, was due to uh, tourism, to the higher profile that the Finger Lakes uh, was seeing, not only in the, the wine industry, but also in, in tourism and visitation. We went from that number one in, in 1978 to today around Seneca, there's, there's well over 60. We can grow beautiful grapes here. Um, we're getting more and more recognition. Hazlitt's winemaker, Michael Reedy, has been making wine in the Finger Lakes for 10 years. It wasn't established as a, a world-renowned region, and now even in the last five, six years, we're starting to get some national attention, international attention, people are recognizing this as a, as a world-class wine region. We're world-class, but we're also still learning what we're, who we are and what we're doing. There's very few businesses in life uh, where you can take something from beginning to end. You take a grapevine, you plant it, put it out in the vineyard, you grow it, it takes three to four years to grow it, you nurture it, you, you then harvest the fruit, uh, you then make the wine, you create the label, uh, and you do all of that, and then you have the opportunity to present it to our customer who comes through our, our front door. So I can truly say it's a product that's handcrafted, but I've been involved with it from its birth, so to speak, in the vineyard, all the way to it being poured in a glass. So how does it go from vine to glass? Well, that's what we're looking at next. Stay with us here on Twin Tier Sunday. Welcome back. Today we're exploring Finger Lakes wine country. Now we've seen how the region developed. Now let's take a look at how the wine is made. It all begins in the fall, harvest season. Let's go. So how do all these wineries make the products that make them so popular? Well, the busiest season of all begins in the fall. It's harvest. Well, harvest for us and almost every other winery in the, in the Finger Lakes is really the culmination of a year's work in, in the vineyards. This is my favorite time of year. This is a very exciting time of year. This is about the two-month period of time where everything we do throughout the course of the year is laid out. Um, it's a really interesting part of the year because it can come very quickly. It can come all spread out. It's generally quite intense because we've got a, a relatively short amount of time to bring in certain varieties of grapes. Uh, we're always dealing with, with mother nature as does every other uh, person who's in the agricultural industry. So it, it's really a, it's an ex a very, very exciting time. Usually harvest season runs from September all the way through October, but Mother Nature is the one who dictates that. This year, because of the drought and then the rain we had in August, it was actually a very, very condensed season. So we brought things in when we wanted to instead of when we had to. Actually, yields are, are pretty average. The tonnage coming in is a little light, but in terms of the amount of uh, juice coming in from the tons, or it's pretty average. Uh, I don't think it was anything strange if it had gone, if the drought had gone any longer than it did, we could have seen some issues. Over at Lucas, the winemakers say it's actually been a great harvest for those who love dry red wine. What will happen in um, red wines in a dry year, you, that you'll have smaller berries and then you have more of a skin to juice ratio when they're fermenting. And basically we're going to get more tannin, more color, more flavor out of those smaller berries. So you're going to get a more concentrated wine from a, a season like this. So how does it go from vine to bottle? The first thing we start doing is we look at 
sugar level. So we'll bring in samples from the vineyards. We'll go out and try to see, get a representative sample of what's going on there. We check for sugar levels. We check for acid levels. We look for flavor development. Uh, once we've seen levels of flavor and sugars and acids that we're uh, happy with, or once there's potentially a pressure from Mother Nature because rain coming, we make a picking decision. Every variety doesn't ripen all at the same time, so, which is very fortunate for us. When the grapes start coming in, of course we have to press the grapes, settle the juice, and then we kind of get into this cycle of where we're just uh, working with one variety and then bringing in another variety. Depending on the variety, especially red versus white grapes, the process begins to differ. Take reds, for example. Uh, during the course of that process, every day or so, what we like to do is we either, via a mechanical process, by pushing them down with a, a basically a metal tool or by spraying them over with fermenting juice, we push the red skins back down in. Whites are a little easier, where they simply sit in the tank and they ferment and they're done. Once the grapes are fully pressed and the juice is fermenting and getting closer to wine, each winery decides when their product is ready to bottle. Um, our red wines usually spend about a year in oak barrels and our Chardonnay the same. The white wines where we're trying to retain the crisp, fresh fruitiness of those wines, we age those in a stainless steel tank they're not so much going to benefit from aging. So those wines are going to be bottled early next year. And again, the dry reds, dry whites that we have in barrels will be bottled uh, later next year. As we've grown over the years, the, the basic winemaking process doesn't change. It's, it's nature. It's, it's the yeast converting uh, the sugar in the wine and because they love to eat the sugar. Uh, it's converting it into, base, into alcohol and CO2. However, there's lots of things that we can do today uh, that we didn't have uh, uh, the advantage of uh, a number of years ago. Now, like they said, the winemaking process has evolved a lot over the years. Now, we showed you the short version, but in the middle of all that, things get pretty scientific. And last year, I got a look inside the laboratories. Follow me. I almost joke that we're more like sort of therapist philosophers as we're examining the wine saying, what's in you? What's, what's trying to come out of what we grew? It's an art, but also a science. There are uh, actually chemical transformations that are taking place. You're letting yeast act on the juice, and the yeast eats the sugar in the juice and turns it into alcohol which is what makes the wine nice, and carbon dioxide. And in many wineries, beyond the tasting room and tanks, lies a little laboratory. This is, a, this is an aeration setup that helps us to check free sulfur levels. From alcohol level to pH level to sulfur level and much more. Each test is run to make sure that glass you pour yourself on a Saturday night tastes just right. But some little labs can't do everything. That's why many wineries rely on the Finger Lakes Wine Laboratory that runs out of Dairy One Cooperative Inc. in Ithaca. They're a resource that helps make everything a little more exact. We offer all the standard tests for uh, different acids and sugars. Many wineries use the lab for more complex tests, like testing yeast assimilable nitrogen, nitrogen playing a big role in fermentation. 20 years ago when we started, there were a lot of tests that a lot of the wineries had to do for flaws because there wasn't as much winemaking knowledge and so a lot of the wines we really did just sort of throw in the yeast, we collectively throw in the yeast and walk away and let it make itself and then we would come back over the winter and say, oh, something's wrong there, we got to fix that, we got to fix that. And if the nutrients aren't properly balanced? You can have anything from a hard-boiled egg to rotten egg all the way up to the smell of, you know, well water, the worst well water you've ever smelled. Constantly testing helps avoid that. They'll take a sample immediately and call us and then we'll go out and get the sample and within 24 hours they'll get the result, their nitrogen result, so they can make that decision. For, I mean, everyone, it's, it's nice to have the check. It's, it's really nice to have somebody that's, that can go in there and, and, and prove that your work is proper because, you know, we all got, kind of get a little blind and sometimes we hurry along. But the Finger Lakes Wine Lab says it's not just about being exact, it's about the confidence, supporting the already good winemakers to help give their wine that extra edge. They're artists. They are scientists, but a lot of them 
you know, we're there to help them with the scientific aspect so that they can focus on the more subtle things, the, the art of the wine. And although the lab helps test everything down to the nitty gritty, everyone seems to agree that making a good glass of wine can be done without going any further than the use of your own senses. I mean, I still say the tasting is part of the science because you're analyzing, you're picking it apart. But by doing that, I think that builds a little of what many people would perceive as the artistry, which is this sort of ultimately somebody saying, ah, that's it, okay, we're there. And you know, is that art or science? Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> and as the winemaking process continues to evolve, so does this region. And after the break, we'll sit down with the Finger Lakes Wine Country Organization to see how this region is expanding and how you can enjoy it all. Stay with us. I'm now joined by Lori Poland. She's the president of Finger Lakes Wine Country Tourism Marketing Association. Thanks so much for joining me today. You are very welcome. Glad to be here. I'm happy to have you. Now you know everything about this whole region and we've gone over the history, we've gone over harvest, we've gone over winemaking. Now let's talk tourism. So how has this region grown over the past, you know, 40 more years? You know, this region has always looked like this. There's always been people visiting the state parks. We've had uh, Watkins Glen, the, the Speedway. We've had um, uh, the National Forest. We've, our lakes have been here. They've been here for 10,000 years. But when wine came in, the story changed. Wonderful. Now, you said that you were once a tourist here, and that's what brought you to the area, is that right? I was, I was. I lived in the central Pennsylvania area for 20 years. And I was looking for a place to go for the weekend. And a friend of mine said, go up to the Finger Lakes. And I thought, ah, it's too far away. And it's not. Three and a half hours from, from Harrisburg. And I was up here. And I stayed the weekend. Two weekends later, I came back. I came back the next month. I fell in love with it. Right. That's amazing. I mean, how can you not fall in love with this region? Now, um, how has it expanded over the years? Well, of course, we've had our wineries. We've had our wineries ever since Constantine Frank, since the Wagners, since Glenora, since Standing Stone, uh, Hazlitt, you know, all the Lucas, all the historic names in, in winemaking and, and production. But with that, you know, the rising tide raises all boats. And so uh, the, the terroir allows us our dairy farms, our, um, our breweries, distilleries, cideries, literally some of the finest in the world. And it has become a world-class region, you know, right here in New York State. What does the Finger Lakes region really mean um, compared to some of these other regions? It's, it's very up and coming and uh, as some people have described it, world-class. It is world-class. And because of where we're located, you know, on our world, very, very similar to the Rieslings, for example, in Germany. And the fact that we're right here, right in this own backyard, does not negate the fact that the quality is truly world class. So the, the, our folks that are in the, the listening area, it is absolutely amazing to me that what you have in your own backyard is within a half hour, hour drive, 130 wineries, several dozen breweries, cideries, distilleries. There is so much that I, I encourage our, our listeners to come up and visit us. Good breeds good. And by having such a strong winery um, program and a quality wine program, it brings quality elsewhere. So we have phenomenal bed and breakfast. Our culinary scene is out of this world. We have 3,500 uh, hotel rooms, just hotel rooms alone, within these three lakes, Cuca, Seneca, and Cayuga. So there's always a place to stay. We're open year round, so the folks that don't want to deal with crowds, if they want to speak one-on-one -on -one to a winemaker, they can come in 
December, January, February, and really learn what the folks do here so well without having to wait in line for it. Right. Yeah, we're here at Standing Stone on Seneca Lake on the first day of snow pretty much this season, and it's absolutely beautiful. So that is something you wanted to mention. They are all open year round. Absolutely, absolutely. I would make sure that I would call ahead. There's maybe a half a dozen wineries out of 130 yeah. that may be open weekends. Uh, Standing Stone is open every day, as are most of the wineries here on Seneca. But again, with Cuca, Seneca, and Cayuga, 130 wineries to choose from, you're going to find something you like. Exactly. Now, we also wanted to talk about some of the different special events that happen throughout the year um, with the trails. And so, even you know, off the trails, what are some of these events that people can enjoy and how can they learn more about them? Well, we all know that we don't necessarily need our visitors in June, July, August, September, October. They're coming. Yeah. They are coming. So starting in October and through till about May or June, we have monthly wine trail events. I don't care if you're talking about the Seneca Lake Wine Trail, the Cuca Lake Wine Trail, or the Cayuga Lake Wine yeah, Trail. All of them have something going on every single month. And for a one ticket price, there's tastings and pairings, and there's usually a specialty. There might be a barbecue night. There might be um, red, red wines. There might be um, pairings with wines and cheese. It's whatever you want, and it's every single month. Wow. Now, where can people find some more information about that, more about the whole region, you know, what you guys do with Finger Lakes Wine Country? Yeah, absolutely. FingerLakesWineCountry.com. It's a mouthful, but you're going to mm -hmm. find everything you need. Mm -hmm. And if you have a smartphone, I would recommend downloading our free app, uh, Android or, or iPhone, and it's just Finger Lakes Wine Country, and all of our events are listed. So you can literally pick a day and you can see everything that's going on that certain day. So you can plan ahead, you can tell your friends, you can say, hey, think about coming next weekend because there's a wine trail event on Seneca. Or think about coming uh, next Thursday night because there's a pasta night at Glenora. There are, then you can plan ahead and you know exactly what's going on. Well, Lori, thank you so much for joining me today. Now we're gonna go run through the vineyards, mm -hmm. maybe do a tasting. We'll see you later. <laughs> Cheers. Now that's all the time we have for this week. Thanks so much for joining me. Go home, uncork your favorite bottle, pour yourself a glass, and we'll see you again next time. <laughs>